Hello, I'm John Percy from the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. I'm a professor emeritus, which means I'm technically retired. I've been around the University of Toronto since 1958, so that makes me somewhat qualified to talk about the history of astronomy in Toronto. Well, the first observatory in Toronto was actually brought by the mother country, the colonizer, the British Admiralty, uh, as part of an international project to try and figure out why compass needles tended to wander. And so they installed a small observatory on what's now the campus of the University of Toronto, as well as several other places around the world. They concluded that the compass problem was caused by the sun, its magnetic field and its influence on the Earth. And when they had uh, finished the uh, study, they packed up the observatory and took it back to the mother country. But that was the time that Canada was uh, becoming a nation and the Canadian government, such as it was in those days, decided that they should have an observatory for practical purposes like timekeeping and um, geodesy and things like this. And so in 1853, they built a small observatory, again, on what's the, uh, now the site of the University of Toronto campus. And that observatory was active for about 50 years until uh, in the early years of the 20th century, um, the building of Convocation Hall at the University of Toronto threatened the uh, little observatory with demolition until a bright young surveying professor by the name of Stewart uh, said, why don't we just disassemble the observatory and move it a few hundred meters away and put it in some other location, which they did and it still exists in a, a little hill beside Hart House at the University of Toronto. It was used for astronomy for a period of time, uh, then was taken over by the University of Toronto Student Union uh, now it's temporarily vacant, but will almost certainly have some astronomical and perhaps public function uh, as part of the uh, current uh, rebuilding of that part of the University of Toronto. In 1890, a young fellow by the name of Clarence Augustus Chant graduated from University College at the University of Toronto and a year or two later, he returned to the university in 1892 to become a professor in the Department of Physics. And he was deeply committed to astronomy, building up an astronomy program at the university for the training of young astronomers. And for this, he was particularly keen on having the university build a major observatory which would be used for research, for student training, but also for public outreach as well. So he developed a strong undergraduate program in astronomy, eventually a graduate program, took a year off himself to go to Harvard to get a PhD a degree in astronomy, and he continued to press for a major observatory and at one public lecture that he gave, uh, a gentleman from the back of the room came up after the lecture, introduced himself as being David Dunlap and having an interest in astronomy and chance uh, observatory project. Uh, sadly, Dunlap died uh, a few years later, but Chant was able to convince his widow, Jessie Donalda Dunlap, to donate the funds to build a major observatory for the University of Toronto. And so came into being the David Dunlap Observatory, opened in 1935 with the second largest telescope in the world. Now initially the research at the Dunlap Observatory was primarily about stars using a technique called spectroscopy to determining the properties and the motions of stars, particularly variable stars and binary stars, stars that existed in pairs that orbited around each other. And uh, for the first decade or so, I suspect that was considered a rather mundane thing, but it was realized uh, fairly soon on that binary stars could be very exciting objects because of the way that the two stars could interact each other.
And this led to the identification of an object called Cygnus X1. This was a star which was apparently producing X-rays observed by an X-ray satellite, which stars don't normally do. And so a U of T astronomy professor, Tom Bolton, began to study the star that was um, involved in this X-ray source and discovered that the visible star was orbiting around an unseen object, the one that was producing the X-rays, and that turned out to be a black hole. So it turns out then that in uh, 1971-72, Tom Bolton was able to identify the first confirmed black hole in space. And this was perhaps the real highlight of the uh, history of the Dunlap Observatory. Well, after the discovery of Cygnus X1, which obviously attracted a huge amount of public interest, uh, the observatory continued to do research, uh, again to do with stars and uh, binary stars and so forth, but gradually because of the encroachment of the city and uh, brightness of the sky and weather conditions, it became more and more difficult to do a research at the Dunlap Observatory. Um, though one or two faculty members to continue to do um, really good stuff. But the real interest in astronomy observations was now moving to places like Chile and Hawaii where um, the weather and sky conditions were much, much better. And so the university, with the approval of the Dunlap family, uh, made the decision to sell the surrounding lands to uh, developers. That was in 2008. The proceeds of this were used to endow the Dunlap Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics, which is based on the, the downtown campus of the University of Toronto. But the observatory buildings, uh, including the telescope, uh, remain. They have heritage status. They are now owned by the city of Richmond Hill. Uh, they're operated by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and other groups for science outreach to the public and to schools, particularly astronomy outreach, so people still have a chance to look through the largest telescope in Canada, a huge thrill for them. So in a way, it's been a win-win situation that the observatory goes on with its public education work it has a long history of dating back to Chant, to Helen Sawyer Hogg and so forth. And at the same time, the proceeds of the lens are used to endow a major facility on the University of Toronto, uh, which perpetuates the name of David Dunlap for many, many, many years to come.